Since the dawn of humanity, people have been looking for explanations about things beyond their power of understanding. Thus, demons, gods, ghosts, or other fantastic creatures appeared in their beliefs. The entire planet bears the footsteps of these entities who have left their mark on the culture and folklore with peoples that have been contacting Puma Punku, Chechen Itza, the pyramids of Egypt, the rooms and tunnels under the Buchech Mountains, which are said to have been built by a race of giants, some of them representing the source of stories or legends about space visitors or winged angels who fought in the name of the Lord. The evidence that something extraordinary happened at Puma Punku is in front of our very eyes. Because at Puma Punku, we find evidence of stone cuts that we today could only replicate if we used the most sophisticated of technologies. Ancient Egypt had always been polytheistic, many gods, and then there is a new leader, a new pharaoh with a new idea. Akhenaten announces there will be one god, they will be a monotheistic people. Aten, the sun god, would be the one divinity they all worshipped. The image is the sun disk. Literally, the whole life of ancient cultures was conducted under the direct guidance and participation of the gods. Our ancestors described them as real beings, even though many historians consider them to be just primitive fantasies. The secrets of free energy, the secret space program, or the true nature of the cosmos. The governments of the world and the hidden masters of the New World Order are, at this point, the most discussed topic in the online environment and vehemently denied by the American government. Anyone who truly knows the story of Nikola Tesla would tell you how they gaped in awe and shook their head in sadness. The awe would be because of how great Tesla's innovative mind was and the sadness would be about what could have been possible if Nikola Tesla had received all the necessary attention and support he needed and rightfully deserved. Tesla went out to Colorado Springs to see if he could send electricity miles, which is a tremendous achievement, but he had a huge tower, and there was 200 feet to the top. His assistant was located at the laboratory, and Tesla said, when I give you the signal, I want you to throw the switch and fire up the wireless system, and Tesla probably walked four miles away. As we all know, the media, still in the hands of the global evil elite, do not sweat any words about the existing technologies it owns that could pull mankind away from the crisis, but also from the fossil fuel age and the provision of free energy to mankind, thus making an enormous leap in the evolution of civilization. He would see an invention appear before his eyes in almost holographic detail. He said that he could rotate these visions, take them apart piece by piece, and he knew exactly how he was going to build these inventions. One of his greatest inventions that never saw the light of day because he could not find funding is the Wardenclyffe Tower, or better known as the Tesla Tower. This genius believed that he was able to find a way to transmit energy through the air, just as today we are able to transmit data wirelessly, thanks to many towers around the world that serve as transmitters. This was a dream so big that having found the resources to create a prototype with his first tower in his laboratory in Shoreham, New York, he would have changed the world forever with one of the evolutions that we can only dream of and maybe compare with the internet or jet engines. Nikola Tesla felt there was a knowledge base located somewhere in the universe that all of humanity could tap into if they just knew how to properly tune their mind to this knowledge base. 
Breakthrough technologies emerge rapidly as time advances, and the public is most of the time left in the dark. What government institutions have developed and understood during the past centuries would greatly challenge our life understanding. So why would they break this perfect control paradigm when they can just leave it so and operate from the shadows? In recent years, countless people have reported seeing flying objects of strange shapes, including triangular and spectacular trajectories. Hundreds of people that came as witnesses and other people just spectators, but lots of people had the same exact story that we had. I told all these people who had seen the UFOs that were helping to back me up. Uh, we're used to seeing a lot of jets and helicopters and everything like that, but to this day I have no idea what I saw and I have no idea what made the light that I saw that night. Without ever challenging the existence of UFOs of ancient origin, we must make it clear that some of such aircraft are in fact owned and used in the greatest secrecy by the U.S. government. Black budget began to come to light after October-November 2012 and rely primarily on the personal testimony of an insider named Daniel, who claims to have been part of the Montauk Project, which later turned into Phoenix 1, 2, and 3. New tonight, details from a top-secret federal budget dubbed the Black Budget. The Washington Post first broke the news online with details provided by none other than former intelligence contractor Edward Snowden. Black Budget is the budget for the U.S. spy services, which include the CIA and the NSA, which you've been reading a lot about, and about 14 other agencies. So it's the total budget for espionage for the U.S. government. These Black Budget projects are carefully guarded by the eyes of the public. One of the main objectives involved in these projects was the testing and development of many technologies based on Nikola Tesla's work – cold fusion, ponds and Fleischmann, nuclear energy reacts, antimatter and anti-hydrogen propulsion systems, and others. Nikola Tesla is the man who had lit the previous century and bridged the gap leading into the next, with over 900 patents approved across his lifetime. Nikola Tesla had a vision, a vision of what's to come into the future. Tesla had enormous dreams, and he had the genius to carry them out. We owe him everything from LED lights, alternating current, Tesla turbine, Tesla coil, radio and remote control, the magnifying transmitter, neon lamp, x-rays, Adams power plant transformer house, induction motor, electric cars, robotics, laser, wireless communications and limitless free energy, artificial tidal wave to electric-powered supersonic airship or death beam, and many, many other patents. And these are all inventions on the surface. Inventions that humans at that stage of evolution could grasp and understand. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, Tesla continually talked about anti-gravity ships that could derive power from his Wardenclyffe towers that were going to be broadcasting power. He claimed that these ships did not have wings or fuel. They were completely electric. If you have the slightest idea about UFO sightings, unidentified flying objects, you probably just stare at the sky and wonder what kind of aliens control these things. But when it comes to TR-3B Astra, it's not what you'd expect at all. To understand the truth about TR-3B Astra, you'll have to catch a glimpse of the world of Aurora, one of the best-kept government secrets to this day. To make a clearer picture, Aurora is not a planet of aliens or an invading army of cyborgs. As a matter of fact, this name has its roots right here in the US. So what is this TR-3B Astra? The TR-3B Astra, also known as the Black Triangle, is a nuclear-powered anti-gravity aircraft secretly built and maintained by the U.S. government. It all started in 1982 with the Black Program, a secret Air Force project funded with what is known as the Black Budget, estimated to be worth about $3 billion. The technology behind this aircraft is considered beyond everyday technology. 
Some even point out that it might as well have been inspired by alien technology. For example, this aircraft has a stealth flight mode, a trait uncommon for decades ago. The TR-3B Astra is extremely lightweight, giving it the ability to easily outmaneuver other aircrafts. This is possible through a technology known as MFD technology. The MFD is a short form of a circular plasma-filled accelerator ring called a magnetic field disruptor. This technology, designed by the Sandia and Livermore laboratories, is so powerful that it was concealed entirely by the government, making it non-existent on paper. As you would expect, a lot of money goes into this research. A good amount of tax money pour into this project carried out at the notorious Area 51 Groom Lake Air Base in Nevada. The development of these technologies has led to the creation of a secret space program that goes well beyond the scope of information NASA has chosen to publicly release in terms of the true nature of the cosmos. Many of these projects are funded from the black budget, with huge sums of money and by the global banking cartel as part of the diversion of global collateral accounts. The first thing was, was documentation. Um, I used a program called Land Search, a thing that once you had control over the domain, um, because you'd get control of domain controllers, so you own the whole network, basically. And uh, Land Search could actually search all the files and folders on every machine. And obviously it's hard because things aren't going to be called secret UFO data .pdf, are they? Mm. So, um, but I'd scan and look for documents, etc., etc., and I found an Excel spreadsheet that was actually called, or at least in, in the heading of the column, it said non-terrestrial officers. And I was like, my bloody God, that's just non-terrestrial officers. Non-terrestrial officers with um, ranks and names, mm -hmm. and uh, then a separate sheet uh, with tabs for material transfer between ships. And these were, I mean, I don't remember the names now. It's, you know, it's a long time ago. A lot of people give me a hard time for not remembering the names and stuff, but it was a long time ago. Right. But uh, non-terrestrial officers thought, well, it must be, let's try and cut out all the possible um, conventional explanations first. I searched for that term. It was nowhere. It was right. nowhere at all. Now, if you search for the term, you only find links to me and right. stuff that I've said. Right. right, I see, I see. So it wasn't a standard thing in the military at all. Right. Um, so I took that to be, they must have a space-based, a secret space-based... So the non-terrestrial officers, what, it couldn't be astronauts? It could be. I mean, that, that's the thing, it's up to you how you interpret that, isn't it? Right. But these ships were called USS whatever and USS whatever. That implies Navy, and I think the Navy, the Navy do a lot of space stuff, right. the US Navy. And, and so how many officers' names would, would you estimate were listed and how many ships mm. were listed? Probably, oh God. I think there was probably one screen full of officers' names. So what's that, 25 rows right, on an Excel okay. spreadsheet? Mm -hmm. And these were ro low resolution days as well. So you're talking yeah. about 800 by 600 screens, not very big. Uh, but the ships was probably, I don't know, a third of the spreadsheet. So estimate how many different ship names you saw? Oh God, maybe eight, ten. One of the most stunning public information on the existence of this secret space program comes from the testimony of British Gary McKinnon, his story is extraordinary. From February 2001 to March 2002, McKinnon, as an independent computer system administrator, managed to gain access to the highly classified documentation of the Pentagon's computer networks. The U.S. government claims that McKinnon violated the operating law in the Defense Ministry's IT system, which posed a threat to national security. The government tagged McKinnon as hacker and cyber terrorist. Over the years, the US government has demanded the extradition of McKinnon from England. However, there was an obstacle in their plans. If he was extradited, he had the legal right to appear before a court, and there is the risk of revealing the true nature of information in the Pentagon's computer files. The existence of the Solar Warden codename given to a particular area in the secret space program. McKinnon admitted during live interviews that the government's accusations against him are being manufactured and he has not caused any harm to the Pentagon's digital operating systems. Uh, when you're in the command line interface and you type in NetStan, 
Windows has a, a function where when you list all the machines on the network, there's a comment field, and NASA had used a comment field uh, for standard computer audit information that said this isn't building blah, that, you know, this is the serial number, et cetera, et cetera. So finding building eight was surprisingly easy, surprisingly easy. And uh, so then I scanned that subnet, so I think it was only 255 machines on the subnet for building eight. And um, there they were. These, all these machines with blank administrator passwords. It was, it was as if when they built the network, they'd used an image and blatted out the image to every machine because every single machine had a blank administrator password. Mm -hmm. An administrator gives you full control, so it's, it was a ridiculous. In building at the Johnson Space Center, I found out there were files, sorry, folders, called uh, raw and filtered or processed and unprocessed. And these files were like 200 odd megabytes, you know, 250 megabytes. They were in a, a proprietary NASA format. And um, this is in the days of 56K dial-up, so you, know, you could download them in like five minutes. And uh, I wanted to you know, get on there, find out what I could, and get out quickly. And so I had remote control of the desktop using a program called Remotely Anywhere. And um, so if you double clicked on an image, their proprietary software came up and the image was there. But it wasn't there like that because it's a slow connection. Um, I turned it down to I think two bit or four bit color. I can't remember if it was monochrome or just four, four bit color. And uh, it started, you know, juddering down the screen. I think remotely anywhere, anywhere was a Java app at the time. And I uh, only got to see about half or two thirds of it or something. But it was a hemisphere of a planet, which I assume was Earth, because it was blue and it was cloudy. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it was a, a classic cigar shape uh, with, you know, no seams, no rivets, no sort of workmanship on the outside. But it did have one sort of human looking thing, which was the sort of geodesic domes that you see at Men With Hell. Um, above and below, to the left and the right, and one, you know, on its nose, and I assume, sorry, one on this side, and I assume one on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, some people say that could have been man-made because of that geodesic dome feature, um, but the fact of, it all flowed in. There was no, there's the tube, and there's a socket for the dome, mm -hmm. you know. It was all a flowing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that's when I saw someone else, the mouse moved, right-clicked on the LAN icon, disconnect, and boom. Once the U.S. government learned about the true nature of the information over which McKinnon fined, the U.S. abandoned the accusations against him, despite the fact that the U.S. considered him a cyber terrorist. If you ever wondered if the show Project Blue Book, premiering on the 8th of January 2019, is a work of fiction, let us quickly assure you that it is not. In fact, what this show is based on is a true story of a government project that was carefully swept under the rug. The project, as you might well know, is the Project Blue Book. Project Sign officially argued that these UFO sightings were authentic and hinted that they were in fact extraterrestrial in nature. But the higher-ups in the military stepped in and redacted those statements, canceled Project Sign, turned it into Project Grudge, which ultimately became Project Blue Book. What you may think you know about the project might not be completely true. However, we shall now try to delve into what really happened with this investigation, what its mission is, and why it had to be aborted and kept classified for a long time. To go back to the beginning, we have to head as far back as 1947. This was just as the Cold War was starting. On July 7, 1947, at Edwards Air Force Base, then called Morocco Air Base, Major J.C. Wise was sitting in his XP-84 fighter jet experimental aircraft when he noticed that people on the ground were watching an object off in the distance. There was suspicion in the air, and there were many reasons for this. So when a businessman and pilot known as Kenneth Arnold made a report on June 24, 1947. It quickly raised the fever. Later, when asked by a reporter to describe how they flew, Arnold said their motion was like saucers skipping over water. In the papers the next day, the world first saw the term flying saucer. Right here, we've seen something, I've seen something, hundreds of pilots have seen something in the skies. We have dutifully reported these things. 
And we have to have 15 million witnesses before anybody's going to look into the problem seriously? Why, this is utterly fantastic. This is more fantastic than, than flying saucers or, or people from Venus or anything. After the sighting, it was actually required that all officers fill out a form if they saw anything that might be regarded as a UFO or a flying saucer. And in addition to that, they were told not to discuss their sighting or what was on their report with anyone. Kenneth's report was clear and direct. He had observed nine flat disc-like aircraft near Mount Rainier, Washington. They were flying at incredibly high speed. His description of them was so vivid, and the press, who quickly dubbed those aircrafts as flying saucers, was the beginning of thousands of other similar reports. In fact, between that first incident in 1947 and when Project Blue Book was terminated in 1969, a total of 12,618 sightings of strange things moving in the sky had been reported across the United States. Considering the way the U.S. government has labeled UFOs top secret, we have to at least be open to the possibility that higher-ups within the U.S. government, or even those higher than the U.S. government, are absolutely aware of extraterrestrial involvement in human affairs and have sought to cover up this phenomena for the past six decades. And what you can see behind me here, of my left shoulder, is this object that has become a sort of an iconic representation for all that is not yet fully understood about the Nazi technology, the advanced technology, that there is a lot of evidence that is gradually being accumulated by Igor Vitkovsky and others that during the Second World War the Nazis were experimenting with things that even now, 60 years later, we might not fully understand in the public domain. And uh, a little later on in this video you'll be seeing us talking with Igor in detail about the evidence that he's amassed to suggest very strongly to many other researchers that the Nazis were doing something very, very strange and that this project here, which has become known as the Nazi Bell, may well have been the most top secret of all their top secret projects. Few people were aware of it since it remained a secret for many years. It was an anti-gravity UFO-like saucer craft that many believe could travel across time. This mysterious Nazi bell is known to have served several purposes, including helping the Third Reich reach space, visit the Moon and Mars, and even distant star systems. It describes uh, various uh, secret projects of the Third Reich, but the most important part of it is, uh, is the one that deals with uh, anti-gravity. It was something that looked just like from another world. It was so shocking and presented such a new picture of the, of, of the German research in the Second World War. Something that uh, was breaking all the known rules as far as the research is concerned. Such a shield, such a cylinder, uh, which was covering uh, certain rotating cylinders inside. It was very, at first glance, it was simple, but uh, the effects of this, uh, of, of its operation uh, were very complex and uh, impossible to explain by an uh, entire team of, uh, of specialists who was dedicated to the explanation of this, of this, uh, of this device in the, in the 1960s, for example. This is purportedly possible through the unexplainable UFO-like gravity-defying propulsion system, a cutting-edge technology not available to the masses. The development of this technology was ordered by Adolf Hitler and would play as an essential part in the secret space program initiated by the Nazis. When Hitler noticed that the walls were starting to close on him, he pumped even more resources and manpower into his Wunderwaffe, or wonder weapons, to accelerate the process. This was all in an attempt to radically change the course of the war. This weapon is the Die Glocke, the bell, and was part of the long list of Wunderwaffe that the Nazis developed towards the end of World War II. It appeared that uh, the main aim of this, uh, of this device was to accelerate heavy yuns 
uh, namely of mercury, uh, and spin them at very high angular uh, speeds in order to observe or to create some strange effects, some strange energies produced by this device. If these black budget technologies were released in the world and properly funded, in a generation or even less, we would see the complete end of fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas, and even nuclear energy that would be replaced by Tesla electromagnetism, fusion cold, anti-gravity and anti-hydrogen systems, and much more. This would remove national boundaries and limits and eliminate the need for control structures of any kind, including governments. And with that, I just have two more words to say. Obama out. Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. If these black budget technologies were released in the world and properly funded, we also enter a new era of travel in the universe, through which we as human beings move beyond the planetary boundaries and our solar system, exchange technology and experience with the civilizations of the universe. Is it possible that Tesla developed a time viewing or time travel technology and that he became aware of these developments. However, few people know that Nikola Tesla had tapped into a source of unlimited energy and was on the verge of handing the people of this planet a gift of free energy until the powers that be had stopped him in his tracks. One of the big questions is, who is Tesla? Is he, in a sense, an avatar, an enlightened being that comes to the Earth to help humans? No one really knows exactly what's going on, but I think all great artists, and Tesla saw himself as an artist, feel that they're instruments of a higher purpose, and Tesla certainly felt that he was working along those lines. There is an agenda for humanity. There is a plan. And in every generation, whatever power it is that's behind the plan sends to Earth certain specific souls who are by birth more inclined and able to be receptors to the higher knowledge. The most important thing Tesla required in order to accomplish his plan was funding. He was an inventor, not a businessman. So during his lifetime, he came across various hurdles that would hinder his progress towards the future he envisioned for humanity. Even so, Tesla pursued his dreams until his final hour. Not only he wished to give free, wireless energy to the world, he also wanted to establish long-lasting peace on Earth. For this goal alone, he designed the perfect plan. He would engineer a weapon so powerful that its energy bursts would bring down a fleet of 10,000 enemy airplanes at a distance of 200 miles from a defending nation's border and will cause armies to drop dead in their tracks. The concept of Iron Beam is that it's essentially a high-energy laser that is designed to rapidly heat up the target that it's aimed at. We're talking about aircraft, drones, missiles. Anything that could launch an attack on a city could be literally destroyed in the sky by Iron Beam. And so the idea that Tesla might have worked on an anti-gravity device is very plausible to me. Nevertheless, it confirmed that such an explanation, uh, that such effects could indeed take place and it could be an anti-gravity device. After more than 15 years of researching archives in different countries, Igor Witkowski, a Polish journalist and author specializing in the military technology and history of World War II, published Prada o Wunderwaffe, a book that discussed Die Glocke at length. There are reports of the witnesses, I mean the uh, prisoners of war, of the SS officers, and one of them described this, uh, that this device, the, the, the Glocke, the bell, was uh, surrounded by a uh, circle of, of cables. Prada o Wunderwaffe would later become a huge success after British military journalist and author Nick Cook quoted him in his own book, 
the hunt for zero point inside the classified world of anti-gravity technology. It has since been reviewed by lots of writers and researchers. In fact, other writers like Joseph P. Farrell later associated it with Nazi occultism, anti-gravity, and free energy research. So what did Igor Witkowski, Nick Cook, Joseph P. Farrell, and many other writers and researchers discovered about the Nazi bell? The Glocke, the bell, was almost finished by the Germans. It uh, was carried out in uh, Lower Silesia or Niederschlesien in German. And uh, uh, the device worked, but uh, they only managed to, uh, to finish the phase of trials. And the industrial phase was not even started, as far as I know. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there was some place which I don't know. In Witkowski's book, he wrote about the discovery of Die Glocke through some transcripts from the Polish archives. He wouldn't have been able to access this document without one of his Polish intelligence contacts. Although he was not allowed to make copies of these documents, he was allowed to transcribe them. What he found in these transcripts shocked him. It was from an interrogation of a captured former Nazi SS officer, Jakob Sporenberg. I met this guy in 1986, around 1987, I'm not sure. His name was Władysław Wuczak, or Wiesław Wuczak, excuse me. And uh, what he, what I saw on his table, it was uh, really a world apart. I just saw analyzes various materials, diagrams, uh, all various publications on the, on the specific subjects uh, involved. And uh, it was just very serious stuff. It was, you know, he was talking about this normally. And it wasn't any secret then. Maybe later, maybe now it is a secret. I don't know, but then it wasn't a secret even. And he published even several articles about it as a member. I don't know if he introduced himself as a member of the general staff, civilian employee, in fact. But uh, what I can repeat shortly is that uh, as a military journalist, I had contacts with some people. And uh, I know that the, the phenomenon that you're talking about is real and it's something uh, serious and this, uh, uh, contrary to appearances, is treated very seriously by several, by several institutions. I know that. Witkowski relates in his book the presence of a strange bell that measured four and a half meters in height by two and a half wide. Its shape is similar to that of a large bell, that is also where it got its name. According to his description, it was made of an extremely durable metal alloy, covered with ceramic, and on the inside, it housed two counter-rotating cylinders that contained a violet liquid with a consistency similar to that of mercury. The journalist identified this liquid as serum 525, and it was also stored in a one-meter-long thermos capsule coated in lead. Other researchers added components, such as light metals, leichmethal, thorium, and beryllium peroxides, elements commonly used as fuel in nuclear reactors. From Cook's description, De Glocke was revealed as a strong radiation-emitting craft. The radiation is released upon activation. And the effect? A bell-shaped machine capable of potentially destroying everything and everyone close to it. After all, it was designed to be able to pierce time and space. Scientists were reported to have suffered from a very terrible case of vertigo. They would later die, because the levels of radiation that the bell emitted when it was activated were just dangerously high. 